Well, good evening, uh, uh, my beautiful friends. I hope uh, you have found your seats. My name is Zahid Makhdoum and I am a member of the Hari Sharma Foundation Board of Directors and I have this uh, uh, remarkable privilege and honor of uh, greeting you this uh, evening. Uh, before uh, we do the greetings, I would like to acknowledge that we are uh, coming to you and you are all enjoying these uh, proceedings uh, on the unceded uh, uh, land uh, and territories belonging to the Stolo, uh, Salvatooth, Musqueam people. We had a beautiful sister by the name of Taylor McCarthy. She is member of the Squamish Nation. She was uh, born uh, south uh, of uh, 49th parallel. Uh, however, she moved uh, to Canada in uh, 2012 and has been very uh, vibrant member of the First Nations uh, uh, communities. Uh, she was to welcome you um, uh, on, on behalf of the First Nations people. Unfortunately, there was a, a family emergency. As a consequence, she could not attend tonight. So you will have to just deal with my, uh, my welcome. I am sorry, it probably will be difficult on your heads, but we'll try to make it easy. On behalf of uh, Vancouver Democracy Alliance and on behalf of the Hari Sharma Foundation, I welcome you all to this event, which is first of its kind, uh, because this is our first annual event where we uh, have uh, come to one conclusion that it's very important that we acknowledge the amazing commitment and the great deeds of her comrades and friends, sisters and brothers, who have done a lot for the community and who have been a consistent providers of courage and wisdom to our communities. It's important that we acknowledge them and we uh, recognize uh, their uh, uh, contributions to the communities as a whole. This year, we have uh, two such luminaries uh, who, who will be introduced in a short uh, uh, period of time. But before we do that, it's important that you know that Vancouver Democracy Alliance is a collective of uh, like-minded friends and comrades, uh, people from uh, independent Jewish voices, uh, people from South Asian Network for Secularism and Democracy, uh, people from Hari Sharma Foundation. Uh, these are the comrades who have uh, joined hands together uh, with uh, independent uh, thinkers and intellectuals uh, like uh, Dr. Ramana, uh, who are uh, uh, organizers of this event for you. And we are very grateful that you have taken time off today to come and uh, be here instead of uh, sitting at your home thinking, how are you going to be voting tomorrow morning? I, I, I'm pretty sure that you all know how you are going to be. Who are you going to be voting for? But it's important to strategize how you are going to be doing it so that you spend uh, quality time in a lineup and uh, have a conversation with uh, friends and comrades who will be with you. So it's important to have those reflections. This is how we are going to do. We will first and foremost uh, uh, do the award ceremony. Uh, there, there are two uh, awardees, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Mordecai uh, 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 Breenberg. He is... Uh, And uh, uh, David Barsamian, and <laughs> uh, 
both of these uh, comrades are a source of inspiration for uh, uh, humble humans like me. We look at them for uh, uh, wisdom and for light, for showing us the path and for leading us uh, towards uh, uh, the place where we can find some emancipation for human beings everywhere. Um, uh, th these will be Dr. Uh, uh, Breenberg will be introduced by a brother, uh, Sid Sinead. Uh, I will uh, have the privilege of uh, introducing uh, David. Uh, they will uh, uh, get their awards. Uh, Dr. Chin Banerjee, who is uh, uh, president of uh, the Hari Sharma Foundation. He is also, I think he's, uh, I don't know whether he's uh, still the chairman of uh, Sansad or he is a retired chairman. Uh, he had uh, some health issues, consequently he cut back uh, lots of his activities. Uh, so, Brother Chen will do that, and once the awards are uh, handed out, and uh, Brother Barsabian has uh, finished uh, telling us about uh, uh, Palestine as well as Kashmir, uh, we, we will then uh, have a very short two minutes break to reset the stage uh, for a remarkable art piece that is going to be presented to you. It's a performing art piece. It's a, a play written by a, a wonderful uh, young intellectual, Sana Janjiva. And I will be introducing the play later on to you. Uh, and after the play is over, we will uh, break for dinner. So at this time, be happy with pakoras or whatever else uh, are, uh, is being brought to your table. There is no liquor. It's not okay. I have been told that even wine is available for you. But you'll have to make an effort. Walk there without making any noise, please. Don't shuffle your feet. Quietly walk there. Get your uh, glass of wine and come back. And I would like to now uh, invite uh, my brother and my comrade Sid Sinead to tell us about uh, our beautiful brother, Mordechai Breenberg. Thanks, Sahid. When he was a student in the UK, Mort became active in the anti-nuclear movement and was involved in the Aldermaston March in the Committee of 100 led by Bertrand Russell. Thus began his lifelong dedication to social and political activism in pursuit of peace and justice for all. When Mort went to Berkeley to attend grad school, he became active in the uh, student free speech movement and in organizing opposition to the U.S. war in Vietnam. When he came to Vancouver in 1966 to teach at SFU, he helped found the Committee to Aid American War Objectors and worked in the local anti-war movement opposing the U.S. war. At SFU, Mort contributed to the radical democratic restructuring of the Department of Political Science, Sociology, and Anthropology. The provincial government and the university administration responded by conducting a political purge of the PSA department. Mort and seven other PSA faculty members were fired. SFU was censured by professional organizations for several years after the purge because of the violations of academic freedom associated with the purge. After the purge, Mort remained in Vancouver, where he worked actively with Canadian trade unions in the defense of political prisoners, with activists in Quebec, and in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle against Israeli colonization. He later became a founding member of CanPalNet, the Canada-Palestine Support Network, as well as the Trade Union Committee for Justice in the Middle East. Targeted with a Vancouver Sun slap suit designed to punish him for his Palestine solidarity work, Mort responded characteristically. He chose to fight back by becoming a founding member of the Seriously Free Speech Committee. For the last 40 years, Mort has been involved in anti-colonial and anti-war movements. He helped create the Western Voice newspaper, a democratic outlet for workers, feminists, and prisoners, and others denied justice and dignity. He also became active in Vancouver Cooperative Radio, working for nearly 30 years on the Red Eye program. 
Blacklisted from BC, NBC from teaching in this academic discipline, Mort taught ESL at Douglas College for 25 years. Early in the 1980s, when the KKK tried to set up shop in this province, Mort became a founding member of the BC Organization to Fight Racism, which was successful in chasing the Klan out of our province. In the early 2000s, when George W. Bush began his push for war on Iraq, Mort helped establish StopWar.ca, Vancouver's anti-war coalition. In short, wherever and whenever an issue has arisen demanding a progressive activist response, our friend and ally Mort Breenberg has been there. I could go on reciting his exemplary exploits, but I think you get the idea. So it's with enormous pleasure that I hereby present the first annual Vancouver Democratic Alliance Hari Sharma Award to Mordecai Breenberg. I can't think of a more worthy recipient. Mort's wife, Liz, will accept on Mort's behalf. I just want to say a few words. Thanks, both Said and, and Sid. Good evening, friends and comrades. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of Mordecai when I say that he warmly thanks the Vancouver Democracy Alliance for this honor. He is most gratified by your recognition of his work for socialism and for the respect and demands for people's rights and justice over more than 50 years. Always he has promoted solidarity among progressive forces, and he wishes this newly formed alliance the very best for its ongoing work. He is also most grateful to all those comrades and friends who have worked alongside him on these many issues. He is very happy to see so many of you here tonight and thanks you for coming. I want to add a few comments. I have been looking over Mordecai's files and I'm astounded by the huge amount of unpaid work he's done for community organizations of which he was either a co-founder or a member. The list of such organizations given on the program does not include those of the last 20 years, Stop, which Sid has referred to, Stop War, Camp Alnet, and the Seriously Free Speech, for example. All organizations recognizable to many in this room as significant and demanding. In the 70s, writing, editing, and production of the weekly newspaper, The Western Voice, required a lot of work. As a member of In Struggle, he traveled over much of the province and other parts of Canada doing organizing work. 30 years of contributing weekly to the Red Eye program on co-op radio required hours of work each week prior to the program. His work on Palestinian issues has been long-standing and intense, requiring resilience to combat the smears of anti-Semitism. At one time, he was actually threatened and accused of not being Jewish. His work with the Seriously Free Speech Movement resulted, as Sid has referred to it, a libel suit instituted in 2007 by Can West. After a parody issue of The Sun was issued anonymously in June 2007, marking the 40th anniversary of the illegal occupation of the Palestine territories, and Mordecai had been seen distributing this issue. This constituted, in effect, a slap suit, again, that Sid referred to, which is a strategic lawsuit against public participation, a legal technique to shut down public discussion by the entailing of huge legal costs. And such slap suits could be brought about probably any one of you in this room because of the kind of work you do. With the generous assistance of a lawyer, Leo McGrady, uh, the work of this organization led to the ongoing challenge against slap suits, suits <laughs> and later to the provincial NDP government bringing in anti-slap suit legislation. Another outcome of this organization's work was the demand that the federal government redefine what constitutes anti-Semitism in order to stop this accusation being leveled 
against those criticizing Israeli policies and actions against the Palestinian people. This is still a very current issue. All this work has been ongoing throughout our marriage and still he had time to support me in my work and activities. He has been a very generous and caring partner, a loving parent, and my granddaughter <laughs> insists I say he's a loving grandparent too, and a most deserving recipient of this award. Many thanks to the Vancouver Democracy Alliance for honoring Mordecai and his work with this award, and may the Vancouver Democracy Alliance have great success in its ongoing work. Thank you. Well, uh, extremely grateful to Sister Liz uh, for uh, her uh, beautiful words uh, about uh, our hero, um, our leader, our friend, our comrade, Mordecai. He's wonderful and uh, just... Uh, <laughs> just the privilege of being uh, under the same roof with him is... Uh, quite inspiring for a person like me. So I'm very grateful that he came over and Liz deserves uh, accolades for that. Uh, thank you very much. Now, uh, with respect to David Barsamian, I don't know where to start talking about him. He, he's my friend, he's my brother. Um, and he is probably one of the most generous a kind, thoughtful, and committed individual that we will come across. He's 74 years old. His uh, travel schedule is uh, beyond comprehension. He's uh, here today, tomorrow he'll be somewhere else. He has not slowed down. He has been at it, he has been uh, doing this work for uh, years now. Uh, he is a child of uh, refugees who were fleeing genocide. Uh, his parents, Armenian. Uh, his mother, Araxi, is uh, one of the very well-known uh, Armenian uh, uh, women who lived in New York and uh, with her husband, and that's where Davis was born and he was raised there. He has uh, been uh, editor of uh, Alternative uh, Radio and a director of Alternative Radio, founding director of Alternative Radio for about, I, I would say about 35, 40 years. Uh, his work has produced volumes of literature for uh, younger generation for uh, uh, people like uh, Mordecai's uh, granddaughter or, uh, or uh, Sana Janjua or uh, Sejals of the world uh, or uh, Derek's little uh, boy that he comes to all uh, protest uh, uh, meetings, you know. And uh, though, though that is the record that David has uh, produced and left for us he has engaged in in-depth conversations. I won't say interviews, those are not interviews, those are conversations that he has had uh, with uh, uh, people of significant heft and he has been able to help bring out their reflections, their message, their creed in before all of us. I can name names, uh, we can uh, talk about Iqbal Ahmad, you know, it's a prophet of his time. Edward Said, a prophet of his time. Noam Chomsky, a prophet who continues to be with us, who continues to inspire us, and he continues to show us the right path. Arundhati Roy, uh, Vandana Shiva, you just uh, name people that he has worked with and he has produced 
volumes of for work uh, based upon those conversations that he has had with those people. I mean, there, there was a long time ago, there was, I, I remember a book written by Oriana Falassi, uh, or Falacci. She was an Italian journalist, and uh, the title of her book was uh, Interviews with History. And uh, there, there were some pretty unsavory characters who also were part of that book. And uh, the actual interviews with history, if you want to read, you read David Barsamian's uh, works. If you want to listen to those, you listen to alternative radio. He has been in this city for many, many times. We are very grateful to him that every time we invite him, he's, if he's available, if he's not doing anything else, he does come here and we are very thankful to him and for his generosity with his time. He is, amongst other things, a, 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 an accomplished sitar player. Uh, he speaks uh, Hindi and Urdu with a facility that uh, a Sindhi person like me envies, uh, because I can't speak Urdu like he does, or a, or a Hindi, I can speak Sindhi. Uh, he also uh, uh, is a master in uh, um, understanding the South Asian poetry and South Asian culture. As a consequence, he has been barred from attending, uh, going to India. Uh, he was deported from New Delhi airport because of his uh, reflections on Kashmir and because of his work also on uh, the tribals uh, of uh, Eastern India. I would like to uh, request uh, my brother, my friend, my leader, uh, Dr. Chin Banerjee, to come here and uh, say a few more words about uh, uh, David, and then uh, invite David to receive an award from him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zahid. Uh, what, what can I add? I mean, there's so much to add about David. Uh, but David is an inspiration. David is a friend. David is always here when we need him. Uh, and uh, he keeps on informing us of what is wrong in the world and uh, fighting for justice, inspiring us in the fight. So it's an absolute delight. And when we have time with him uh, to listen to his recitations of Faiz or, or hear him sing, it's a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure always to be with him. And uh, I'm honored that uh, we can recognize him, recognize his work, and he can be with us to tell us about uh, Palestine and Kashmir. Kashmir which is totally silenced, Kashmiri people who have lost, who have been silenced and who do not have a voice right now, I think David will tell us about them. Thank you very much, David. Brothers and sisters, comrades, good evening. It's wonderful to see you here in Surrey. Uh, I accept this uh, honor um, with humility uh, from the Democracy Alliance of Vancouver. Um, I really don't know what to say. I'm a person of words, but I'm at a loss for words when I hear the kinds of uh, generous introduction given by Brother Zahid and dear uh, Chin. 
You know, it's so important to have uh, organizations. It's so important to have a uh, community because that's how we can fight the power. That's how we can organize resistance and engage in the struggle for justice as um, a representative or as a citizen uh, from the country that you may know about south of the 49th parallel, led by the orange-haired man uh, who is very impressed with his own genius uh, and is now uh, wreaking havoc, uh, not just within the US, but uh, around, around the world. I think our role as independent journalists is to go where there is silence, to go where there is darkness, and to shine light into those areas where the power structure wants to uh, manipulate us. Things are very serious uh, in the United States. I don't want to uh, scare you too much, but uh, you should know that there is a steady drift toward more and more autocratic rule, and it's not by accident uh, that the great orange-haired man, whose name I will not mention, uh, the current occupant of the oral orifice, or the oval office, as they also sometimes call it, uh, is moving more and more in, into an autocratic uh, direction. Uh, we see that uh, in, in terms of uh, the kinds of legislation uh, that's being uh, proposed, and his friendship with kindred spirits around the world, like the Prime Minister of India, uh, Modi, with whom he celebrated in Houston, Texas, just a few weeks ago, uh, honoring him. He's his kind of guy, just as uh, Erdogan in Turkey is his kind of guy, just as Duterte in the Philippines is his kind of guy. Uh, these are, you know, these are autocrats around the world. Uh, Urban in Hungary, uh, Kaczynski in Poland, Zeman in the Czech Republic, all over the world there has been a rise of uh, right-wing political power, including in Israel, by the way, uh, which has been under the spell of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu now for many, many uh, years. The country I live in, I'll just read you a little description. On Tuesday, August 20th at 8 a.m., the FBI came to my door. Agents Carlos Medina and Brian Palmer introduced themselves. They wanted to know about my trip to Iran and whether I knew certain people. They wanted me to, I'm using their words, share my experience in Iran. They said with great sincerity, we're interested in your story because the Iranian government targets and manipulates people, and we don't want you to be one of those people manipulated by the Iranian government. I said very little. I told them I regarded their visit as a form of harassment, and they left after about 10 minutes. But it was enough to scare my wife, Kadriye, who is from Ankara, Turkey, uh, because she knows what it's like when state security officers come to your home uh, in the, at 8 o'clock in the morning or at 8 o'clock at night. And uh, initially, you'll get a, a laugh from this, she thought they were Jehovah Witnesses. <laughs> Be because like that, you know, stereotype, they were these two uh, bright young men with suits and, you know, suited booted as they say in South Asia, you know, ties, ties and short hair and very polite, yes ma'am, good morning ma'am, and all of that. Um, and so uh, when she found out who they were, she was, you know, pretty, um, pretty upset. As someone uh, remarked, or actually it was me who remarked, uh, they should be spending their time, you know, investigating white supremacists and, and the terrorists that we have inside the United States, uh, in, rather than investigating you know, independent journalists like myself. But it's, you know, it's part of the atmosphere that we are living in now when you have the chief of state calling journalists, people like me, the enemy of the people. You know, this is right out of Stalin's mouth. This is right out of Joseph Goebbels' mouth, who was Hitler's propaganda minister. Journalists are being singled out, as are 
immigrants, as are uh, people of color, as are asylum seekers from all over the world. So we have now flipped uh, the great poem that's on the Statue of Liberty uh, in New York Harbor. That statue that my parents who came here with the clothes on their back saw in 1921 when they, they met in Beirut in August. They got over to the US uh, in uh, November. They saw that statue that said, give me your tired, give me your hungry and your poor. Today it's give, bring me your rich and those who will enrich me uh, to our shores. So it's, it's a completely different uh, atmosphere uh, now. But as far as being intimidated, I'm not intimidated uh, by the FBI or any other uh, government agency. I'm more energized uh, than ever before. Actually, I wasn't expecting to uh, give this talk right away, so I actually left my notes, uh, Scott, right by you. So I'm going to uh, get into a little bit of uh, what I want to talk to you about this evening, uh, Israel, uh, Palestine, Kashmir, my notes. I'll try and keep this uh, short, brothers and sisters. Uh, did you all see, it's hard to make these things up, you know, it's like uh, the United States is, is an ongoing Saturday Night Live skit. You know, you have this letter signed by the orange-haired man to uh, Erdogan, uh, you know, addressed to your excellency, let's work out a good deal. Uh, a good deal, in this instance, uh, means the potential massacre of uh, Kurdish people. In, in Syria right today. It's, it's absolutely astonishing. Uh, don't be a tough guy. Don't be a fool. I will call you later. Probably didn't call, but um, you, know, you, know what it's, you know what it's like. Now, in terms of uh, Kashmir, it is an, an issue that I'm uh, very concerned about and have been historically, and I know I can find my uh, notes here on Kashmir. Ah, yes. Let me read a few things to you. Our view, which we have repeatedly made public, is that the question of a session in any disputed territory or state must be decided in accordance with wishes of people, of the people, and we adhere to this view. Another comment. We have declared the fate of Kashmir is ultimately to be decided by the people. That pledge we have given not only to the people of Kashmir and to the world, we will not and cannot back out of it. And finally, I have repeatedly stated that as soon as peace and order has been established, Kashmir should decide of a session by plebiscite or referendum under international auspices such as those of the United Nations. Now, who is the author of these uh, observations? Uh, someone known to be uh, very radical and uh, mil militant. The first prime minister of India, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. Pandit Nehru is the author of these uh, comments guaranteeing the right of self-determination to the Kashmiri people, the same right that accrues to Palestinians who are under occupation uh, today, so too do Kashmiris have the right of self-determination. And I'm sure that I am banned from the world's largest democracy because I speak out on Kashmir, because I speak out on the human rights violations that have been uh, proliferating over, over the years, and it's now going on uh, more than eight years since I have been banned uh, from India. I wear that as a, a badge of honor. Uh, for me, it, as people have pointed out, it means you're doing a good job. You know, if governments want to prevent you from reporting uh, on what they are doing, then you are really doing your work. And that's what really journalists should be doing, not just in Canada, but in the United States and elsewhere. The old saying is, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Not what's going on uh, today. Now, Kashmir in, in Urdu is often called janat e nazir you know, heaven without equal. But today, for the Kashmiri people, it is, it is a jahannam e nazir It is a hell 
beyond description. Uh, on the many visits that I went there and we vis you know, investigated unmarked graves, people that had been uh, tortured, uh, widows, uh, kids that had been blinded by Indian security forces. It is one of the most underreported uh, stories anywhere in the world. And there's really an interesting thing, an, again, a parallel between what happened in 1947 with the partition of uh, the Indian subcontinent, with the, with, uh, the issue of Kashmir not being uh, you know, resolved, and the following year uh, in Palestine with the uh, declaration of an independent uh, Jewish state, but not a declaration of an independent uh, Palestinian uh, state. There, there are many parallels and there are also significant uh, differences. Let me just tell you about uh, one of the major parallel. For example, in the United States, and I think I know this holds true in Canada as well, it's very difficult to talk about uh, Israel without, and being critical of the actions and policies of the state of Israel without being uh, derided as an anti-Semite, a Holocaust denier, a Nazi, uh, all kinds of horrible language that we, you know, we are that are simply uh, repugnant. And criticism of a state does not mean you are against this that state. We should have that ability and that right uh, to speak out. Just as you know, if Imran Khan does something uh, that is not. Uh, legal or moral in Pakistan, he should be called out on that. But that doesn't make you anti-Pakistani. In fact, I think it makes you pro-Pakistani. You want your government to be moral and to be on the side of justice, not on the side of the military or you know, corporate forces that have so much uh, influence, not just there in Pakistan, but in the United States of America, which is, you know, have, we have more and more corporate concentration and more and more corporate control. And in the same respect, uh, as it's difficult to talk about uh, criticism of Israel without being uh, derided in, in most uh, uh, obnoxious terms. Uh, it is difficult to talk about uh, India because India has very skillfully won the propaganda war in the United States of America. So if you ask most US people about their thoughts about India, the stereotypes that are generated, and they are stereotypes, is that, well, they're people, you know, meditating, they're living in ashrams, they're all vegetarian, uh, they play sarod and sitar, they love ragas, uh, they, you know, they practice yoga. And so it, India has uh, cemented its, this kind of image over the years, very systematically, through full page ads in the New York Times, to inviting uh, people to go on junkets to uh, Gulmarg or Sonamarg in, in the Kashmiri mountains to go skiing. You know, me meanwhile, just a few kilometers for, from where they're going skiing, massive human rights violations are going on. Uh, there are over 700,000 Indian troops in Kashmir. It is the most densely militarized zone on the face of the earth. And there have been more troops sent since the annexation of uh, Jammu and Kashmir on the 5th of August uh, by uh, Modi and the people around him, particularly Amit Shah, who is the home minister. So what happened on August 5th is extremely uh, dangerous for the future of the Kashmiri people and for the future of any kind of reconciliation and any kind of justice that we hope to see uh, for Kashmir. Uh, I remember it was on Christmas Day, uh, the last time I was there in Kashmir, and I said that the Kashmiri people had the right of self-determination. That is the important uh, legal UN sanctioned uh, you know, motion that we have to push forward. If they don't want to be part of the Indian Union, they have that right to either be independent or if they want to join uh, Pakistan. That is up for the Kashmiri people and no one can take that right away from them. Not Narendra Modi, not Amit Shah. And so India now has opened up a huge can of worms. There is going to be ongoing rebellion, ongoing violence in Kashmir because I know that the people there will resist and they will take up 
if necessary, armed struggle since India has made it virtually impossible for any kind of uh, peaceful resolution. And in terms of Israel and propaganda, the same kind of thing goes on uh, in the US. Israel has been able to label anyone who opposes its policies as terrorists, just as Erdogan calls the Kurds terrorists, just as the Turks in, during the Ottoman period called the Armenians terrorists. It's a, it's a term of derision that is used to silence debate. Oh, we cannot talk about that because, you know, they're, they're horrible people. They kill uh, women and, and children. The state is, in fact, uh, the greatest uh, promoter of violence, not just in, in the Kurdish areas of uh, northern Syria, but in eastern Anatolia in Turkey as well. And the United States, of course, through its policies, has a lot, a lot of responsibility uh, in, in both of these issues of Kashmir. It has looked the other way when Kashmiri rights uh, have been systematically uh, violated. It said nothing when martial law was introduced. It said nothing when uh, Ladakh, which was once part of Jammu and Kashmir, it has three components, uh, is now being ruled from Delhi, and Jammu and Kashmir is being ruled from Delhi. It said nothing about the abrogation and the nullification of Article 370 in the Indian Constitution, which provides a modicum, just a modicum of uh, uh, autonomy for uh, Kashmir. It has said nothing about uh, the nullification of Article 35, which will now allow uh, Indian investment in Kashmir, and no less a figure than the multi Kuropati billionaire Mukesh Ambani uh, has announced that he's going to be investing in Kashmir. So this is a great economic uh, opportunity for the uh, bourgeois um, middle and upper, middle, upper class uh, developers uh, in India to go into Kashmir and to change the demographics of the, of the country as well. That has been part of the uh, Israeli project in the occupied West Bank to change demography, settler colonialism in a classic way that the French settled Algeria, uh, the, the Dutch in South Africa, the British uh, in Kenya and other parts of the world, moving people in and changing uh, the political situation through demographic uh, revolution. So it's an it's a extremely uh, dangerous moment. I think uh, Modi and the people around him uh, have, are, are opening up themselves to a, a, a future of which I think will be a very, very uh, dark. So I could go on and on. I want to read a poem. Some mention was mentioned about poetry. When I first met Edward Said, the great Palestinian academic at Columbia University, uh, it was kind of intimidating because um, he, the first thing he said when I walked into his office was, you better have some good questions for me. And, uh, and I was already somewhat intimidated. Said was a, a very dapper man. You know, he dressed uh, to the nines, and you know, I dress the way I dress, not very spiffy or bien soigné, as they say in French. Uh, and so I was a little uncomfortable, and I was wondering, well, how, do, well, how do I start? And I thought I'd, I'd start with a poem. Uh, Mehmoud Dervish is the national poet of uh, Palestine. And he wrote this poem, The Earth is Closing on Us. Where should we go after the last frontiers? Where should the birds fly after the last sky? Here on the slopes of hills facing the dusk, close to the gardens of broken shadows, we do what prisoners do. We cultivate hope. You who stand in the doorway and here he's, Darish is talking to Israelis, to Israeli Jews. You who stand in the doorway, come in. Drink Arabic coffee with us. After that, it was, the interview went swimmingly well because uh, Said was also very interested in art and culture and poetry. And I could see that this really, you know, opened him up. Now, the current occupant of the uh, White House, the orange-haired man, has said the Middle East is a troubled place. He, he could also say South Asia is a troubled place. There are a lot of bad things happening in that part of the world. This is a very deep analysis, right? 
you ha I hope you're impressed with the, the depth of this uh, uh, perspective. But the, the question arises, yes, those things are true. West Asia and South Asia are very troubled places. But why are they troubled? Is US policy at all involved in creating uh, discomfort or dis-ease in, in, in those regions of the world? Of course US policy is greatly implicated. But the role of propaganda, the role of the corporate media in the United States and elsewhere is to deflect attention from that, from get, shining the light elsewhere, not at the core issue, which is US imperialism, US intervention, US violence. The US has more than 800 bases in over 70 countries. I was just asked this morning at a talk I gave at uh, the Bo BC Humanist Association, uh, a woman asked, what can I do? And I said, well, first of all, you're using the wrong pronoun. You should say, what can we do? Because when we have community, when we have organizations like the Vancouver Democratic Alliance, uh, then we have power, then we have strength, because it's not just one voice. But what you can do is maybe not make that extra trip uh, to the U US. Don't go on shopping sprees there. Economic boycott can have a big impact, and it could have enormous, I think, uh, repercussions uh, on the economic situation, particularly in, in the border states. So think about that as a, as a possible uh, tactic that you can uh, invite. The US, well, I'm going to now quote uh, one of my favorite uh, philosophers who influenced uh, Edward Said and Iqbal Ahmed uh, tremendously, and that would be Antonio Gramsci. He said, and he was an anti-fascist, he fought against Mussolini, the same Mussolini that the RSS and Modi and the people around him admire, the same Hitler that the RSS and Modi and the people around him my, admire, because they showed the world how to deal with Muslims. They showed the world how to deal with minorities. So you have a fascist party, a member of a fascist party, uh, who is now the prime minister of the world's largest democracy. He is, he is what is called a pracharak. He was a, a missionary. At a very young age, Modi joined the RSS, which is the, uh, this right-wing fascist uh, political uh, semi-quasi-military uh, organization that terrorizes uh, people particularly of uh, Muslims. The, you've heard of the, the lynchings, the attacks, people being burned alive, the massacre in Gujarat in 2002 in which uh, Modi was certainly uh, implicated. Uh, those kinds of things are going on. And Muslims in many countries uh, are under attack. Look at Myanmar as well. Look at what's happening to the Uyghurs in Western China. That, I think, has been fed by the hysteria generated by the orange-haired men in the United States against Islam, against Muslims, and targeting them. So I think there is a, a connection. It may not be very urgent, but there is now a wave of uh, anti-Muslim uh, activities by a lot of, a lot of these uh, countries around the world. So Gramsci, who went to jail under Mussolini, who died in Mussolini's jail, a great political philosopher, he said, we have to have pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So what does that mean? Pessimism of the intellect. We look at the situation objectively. There are 700,000 Indian troops in Kashmir. We look at the situation in uh, Palestine. There are almost 700,000 Israeli settlers in occupied pa Palestine, in the West Bank, in land that was supposed to, under Oslo, was supposed to be part of a Palestinian state. That's the objective reality. Now, so we, we shouldn't engage in magical thinking. By magical thinking, I'm, by that I mean going to websites where various conspiracy theories are thrown out about this or that, uh, about uh, you know chemtrails in the sky that are changing the weather, and all kinds of silly things which really distract people from reality. And that, of course, is the, the purpose of many of these uh, fake news sites. So not not swallowing uh, that, that, you know, not swallowing that propaganda, 
but going up against it and having optimism of the will. So looking at things objectively, yes, they are bad, but they can change. Historically, we have always seen movements come from the grassroots, from the bottom up, and that's how social change uh, has happened throughout history. People in, you know, sitting in Islamabad or New Delhi or in Tel Aviv don't wake up, the leaders don't wake up in the morning and say, this is an unjust situation. I'm going to have to change the way we're dealing uh, with this particular issue. It's always the noise in the streets that melts the creeps in the sweets. That's what they, we need to get off the internet and off of Facebook and into the face of these people with power. Now you have an election in this country uh, tomorrow. It's a very important election. But the real work is going to continue beyond who wins, you know. And the way they talk about uh, politics here, it's just like the United States. It's like sports. Well, who's ahead right now? Well, this candidate is catching up, but it looks like, uh, you know, he's not getting enough donations. So I don't know if this is going to, who's going to be the winner. It sounds more like a horse race than an actual, uh, you know, a political kind of uh, uh, situation. So pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. We can overcome these injustices if we form community, if we have uh, organizations. And I want to just, uh, there's so many things to say. You know, look, I have this uh, article from the, the Guardian, from uh, Ranna Ayub. Mobs are killing Muslims in India. Why is no one stopping them? No one is stopping them because the regime in New Delhi approves of mobs killing Muslims uh, in, in India. There was a great, uh, African-American uh, abolitionist, his name, and I don't think, uh, this didn't make it up here. I am, uh, 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 uh. okay, I'm going to have to paraphrase this uh, particular comment from uh, a great uh, fighter for uh, liberation. His name was Frederick Douglass. This is from memory. Power concedes nothing without a demand. Those who want change expect it to come without the work of crops and planting crops and, and harvesting them. Those who want freedom don't want the storm of the ocean and its mighty waters. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. So I want you all to celebrate uh, this evening, celebrate this organization, uh, get involved, get engaged, don't be a fence sitter or straddling or, you know, being on the sidelines, be engaged, be part of this community and move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Barsamian. You are beautiful as always. Thank you very much. As you probably know that uh, every society and every culture has some form of dance to express itself. Uh, Palestinian people who have been uh, living under a horrible occupation for uh, 70 some years they are hum they are dehumanized they are maligned they live not only on the other side of the constitution they even live on the other side of the UN charter of rights as well we have uh, a bunch of young people from Vancouver who all respect uh, Mordecai uh, Breenberg. They respect his work. They honor him. They honor independent Jewish voices. They honor all the comrades and colleagues who are putting their names forward to be known 
as uh, witnesses uh, who are observing the massacre and uh, maligning of uh, Palestinian people. The group is called uh, Palestine Dabke Group. It's a Dabke dance. It's a dance of uh, togetherness. It's a dance of uh, camaraderie. It's a dance of a uh, connection. And it's a dance that uh, we all will be pleasantly inspired to see. So I would like to invite uh, uh, Hatham Al Mayade, uh, Malik, Mira, and all other beautiful friends from Palestine Dabke group to come and uh, help us appreciate their struggle to help us understand their struggle to help us understand their feelings thank you very much
It was so beautiful and so much of energy. Very grateful to you. <clears throat> Let's give a warm applause again to our uh, uh, dancers from Palestine. <clears throat> well, thank you very much once again on behalf of uh, Vancouver a Democracy Alliance, Hari Sharma Foundation, 
independence voices, uh, uh, independent Jewish voices for Palestine and uh, for a committee of uh, progressive Pakistani Canadians, uh, for a South Asian network, for secularism and democracy. Truly grateful to all of you for coming out this Sunday evening to be with us. Very thankful. Uh, we are done for the evening. There is still some dessert left if you wish to help yourself. It is zero calories dessert, especially designed to help you out. So enjoy and we'll see you again next year at our to honor the new recipients of the Lifetime Achievement Award. Once again, grateful to all of you for being here. Thank you. <laughs>